When studying the topic of blockchain, there was a term that came up over and over, and this was the Merkle trees. Uh, I didn't know much about that, but I decided to dig deeper to understand what it was. And what I found out is one of the most interesting data structures that I've seen in my career so far. So I wanted to share with you how it works and why it's useful by using a simple example. So imagine two people, uh, we have John and we have Peter. And John and Peter, they want to have a list of animals. Uh, both of them, they want to keep that list in sync. Uh, and they have their own computers and they're in different places and they cannot share the spreadsheet for some reason. The only way for them to communicate is over the phone and they need to find a way to keep those two lists always in sync. So let's say that the list is um, some just animals like a dog, cat, whale, a horse, mouse, a bird, tiger, and uh, let's say a rat. So we have a list of eight animals. And so the way of, of John to communicate as to Peter is that John is gonna call him over the phone and he's gonna start to pretty much reading out loud the list and Peter's gonna write it down. So I say, okay, the first word is dog. So Peter goes and write down dog, then cat, well, horse, mouse, bird, tiger. But at the very end, Peter misheard the word and instead of rat, he he thought that John said bat, right? So at that point, John is unaware that a mistake was made. And obviously Peter is not aware either that he made a mistake. So as time goes by, John became suspicious that something is up, there's some mistake. And he decides to call Peter to verify that in fact his list is the same as John's. So he goes again one by one and say, okay, Peter, please read out loud the names and I'm gonna verify with you. So Peter goes, uh, okay, dog, and say, John, yes. Cat, yes. Well, and so forth until he gets to the last element and say, bad. And that's when John realizes that is the error. It's not bad, it's rat. So just Peter goes swiftly and just modify the value. And that's it, that's all good. There are two lists in sync. So in this case, it was very straightforward just because there's only eight items in the list. But imagine this problem now having thousands or millions of animals in the list. Pretty quickly, this becomes very uh, time consuming to verify and to, and to know if there was a mistake uh, when the, the values or the animals were communicated over the phone. So this is where Merkle trees uh, are gonna come handy. So the foundation of a Merkle tree is the hash function. Uh, and a hash function is, as the name implies, it's just a function that given an, an end, our input, for example, dog, is going to create an, let's say, an alphanumeric uh, sequence of characters of, uh, or fixed length. Uh, this is really happening at the bit level, but to make it easy to understand, just think about, uh, like, for dogs, it's going to create some kind of random, random looking letters and, and numbers. Uh, although they're gonna look random, these hashes are uniquely connected to its input. So no two inputs uh, or no two values will have the same hash, at least in practical terms. Um, so to showcase how a hash work and, and to build a foundation for, for a Merkle tree to detect errors, uh, we're gonna have to create our own function because it doesn't exist as a built-in function for Google Spreadsheet. Uh, so to do this, this is quite straightforward. We can go to uh, Tools and then to Script Editor. And in here we can write this special function that because it's just for uh, teaching purposes, I'm just gonna call it weak hash because it's gonna be at a trimmed down version of a real hash algorithm. Of course, this function is gonna have an input, which is the value of the field that we want to create a hash from. And in here, we're gonna, we're gonna use a utility function, uh, utilities, and we're gonna call it compute digest. So the compute digest, it's expected to define an algorithm and uh, 
value in this case it's going to use this form right because the value is going to be a string dog cat well and it's going to return an array of bytes so let's use this one here so to define the algorithm one that is very commonly used is the sha256 so to define that one we can use the enum that is available here in the same object util come on where's the value here uh, dot digest algorithm and then sha256 okay and now we know that the value that we want to create the hash from is the actual input of this function so we're going to call this whatever is returned from this function which is an array of bytes let's call it raw hash right because this was created using uh, at the byte level we need to transform that into into alphanumeric characters so we can display it back into our spreadsheet so a simple way to do that is uh, again using the same object but now the base 64 encode that expects as an input an array of bytes and returns a string so this is what we want to do and we'll pass to this function our raw hash and we can return this value right uh, so before making this uh, weaker let me show you how it works uh, in the regular version so let's give this a name and just call it the same as the spreadsheet given that uh, this uh, this script is uniquely bound to the spreadsheet that we have open so there we go so now uh, we can do we can call the function weak hash it's not auto completing but I'm gonna show you how to fix that but for now keep in mind that we can pass an input and what we get back is the hash right so it's a long string with a bunch of uh, characters and if I use the same function notice that the output is significantly different from one another disregard this equal sign at the end this is just the base 64 trying to add some padding to preserve the, the fixed size uh, so one characteristic of a, of a hash function is that first of all it kind of looks random but as i mentioned it's uniquely connected to its input value so if we focus on this entry here dog you can see that this is the hash value that is connected to it or, or created from it and it starts with z w and x if i modify this slightly let's say i add an s you can see that the the hash now it's completely different right there's no resemblance of of the two values or the two strings being connected but if i go back to the original value in singular we get back the exact same hash as before so it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, now to make this example a little easier to follow we're not going to use the whole hash so we're going to use like a, a weaker version of this just by taking the first four characters of this long string so we can go back to our function and just pick up um, the first one so we can use the function slice that takes the first item to the fourth item save and now it's just taking the four first four values of those so all right so let's say that both john and peter they do the same thing right they create the hash for their values let's verify that this okay it's connected to their correct one and there we go so now not only the values are the same but the hashes for both these obviously are the same they're uniquely connected to each other uh, let me add a division here with the two all right so so far we haven't improved uh, much in fact not at all because this is not helping uh, with the fact that we want to detect if there was an error in one of the lists if one of the values are not the same so to make it uh, useful what we could do now is we can concatenate all these hashes into one string and then apply a hash on top of that value and we can compare both values so let's see how it works so let me just add a, a new column here to the right 
And first of all, I'm gonna concatenate all these values, right? So we can use the function concatenate and give me all those. Uh, so as you can see, the, the result is it's just putting like all the strings side by side, Z, W, and X, and then D693 um, uh, until we get to the MVDO. And now we're gonna calculate the hash of this string, right? So we can use the same function by the way, to enable autocomplete, um, we can go back to our function and just add some comments. Uh, and we can define that this function returns the first four characters of the SHA-256 hash value of the input. And we can inform the platform that this is a, uh, let's give it one more space. This is a custom function. So we do that with this annotation, custom function. So by doing that, we can see that now we can, we get in the autocomplete our custom function with the description that we defined there. Uh, so as I mentioned, I want to apply the hash here. So I'm just gonna put it on in front, so weak, hash there you go and we get this value here so to make it easy to to see that this value in fact is connected to all of them i'm just going to combine these cells like that let me just center the value and i'll do the same here for peter i can just probably just copy this function and verify that the references are correct Yes, it's referring to the F column. Uh, so now, not surprisingly, we have uh, the same value for either John and uh, Peter. But now, notice this interesting part. Whenever we made a, a small change, like in the previous example, right? We store bad instead of rat. Obviously, the, the hash here is, is gonna change compared to what John has. But also this hash of the, of the combined hashes it's also different. So now John and Peter, they have a mechanism to very quickly uh, know if there is some inconsistency between the two lists. So instead of going one by one, verifying all the items, John can ask Peter, hey, can you read out loud this hash, this root hash? And as you can see, those two are different. So now they know that there's a, there's a difference in the list. They don't know where, but now definitely they know that there's a problem. So at least it's gonna save a lot of time because a bunch of time this is gonna be the same hash. So they say, okay, there's no need to verify one by one. We know that we have exact same values, but when, when they find that the root hash is different, they know that for sure one of the values is incorrect. So I can go back and modify here, let's say tigers. And again, you can see we get a completely different root hash telling us that uh, an error was made. It doesn't tell us like how many mistakes happen, right? I can have here also cats. And all I know is that something is not exactly the same between the two lists. So let's back to the regular values. Uh, right, so, all right. So we managed to solve one problem, but now we want to even improve the ability to find out which one of the values is the one that is actually different. So to do that, we can expand this Merkle tree uh, by instead of grouping uh, all the hashes into one major one directly, we can define different levels. For example, we can define uh, these four values in its own hash and these other four in its own hash and then calculate the combined hash of these two. So let's see how this works. Let me create more space here. I'm gonna delete this for a moment and I'm gonna create again, concatenate. Let me first concatenate the first half of the list and on top of that, apply the hash as before. So weak hash. And there we go. So we can now copy the same function and apply to the second half of the list, going from B6 to B9, and we get those two values. So to make it more obvious, let's connect these cells or merge the cell like that. 
And now, let's repeat this similar process as before. We can calculate the root hash by concatenating these two and applying the weak hash function on top of that. So we can go concatenate uh, of these two and now applying the weak hash function. All right, so this is connected to all the values, so let's put it like this. And we can apply the same concept here, so I guess we can just copy paste the function and it should work in theory. Let's, let's see, let's see what happens. Uh, so this is referencing, yes, the correct values, this one as well, and this is referencing, yeah, right values. Perfect, so now we have um, a slightly lar larger uh, Merkle tree. And let's see how it works whenever uh, there's a mistake between the two lists. So let's go back and make this mistake here, but, right? So now they know right away that there's an issue. Now they're trying to find where the issue is. So now they go to the second level, say, okay, let's compare this hash. Is this hash the same? And yes, there is. Uh, and because they know that there is a problem, because this is clearly signifying that, they know that the problem is here. They don't need to search and, and validate this cell. They know that if this cell is correct, it means that the issue is in the second half of the list. So they can go right away and check these values, right? In this case, uh, they realize that this is the hash that is different. So if you start counting how many cells they have to compare, you're gonna see that they actually compare one, two, three, four, five, right? So the, to find the error, it took them five uh, tries or, or five cells that they had to search to verify that which one uh, was acting up. We can take this even one step further, and instead of grouping uh, four at a time, like we did in this hash, let's go to a more granular level, level and then just group uh, two items at a time. So again, let's make it a little more, an even deeper structure of, the, of this Merkle, Merkle tree. So I'm not gonna delete this, I'm just gonna copy these values. Uh, let's copy down here so we can compare. And what I'm also going to do is, right, let's copy this because it's the same here, but now I'm going to group uh, in pairs. So I can use this function here, but now let's see, give me only this two, right? All right, so we can copy the function. We're grouping in pairs. Uh, we can merge so it's clear that they represent the hash of the two previous values and we repeat the process one level up so we go here and let's find the combined hash of these two and then the combined hash of these two so you copy the function here and it's gonna be C14 and C16 and I can copy the same here Right, now I can again combine these two like that. So the, the, strict, the tree structure becomes a little more uh, clear. And finally, the root of this Merkle tree, which is gonna be D14 and D18, yes. And now this is the root of our Merkle tree. Now for Peter, same. So I'm just gonna copy the same values and just change the name here for Peter. All right, so when there are no errors, uh, obviously, uh, John and Peter, they start just by verifying the, the root of the Merkle tree. If the root is the same, that's that's it. They don't have to check anything else. They know that the list is exactly the same as, as before. Um, so now when an, an error is introduced, like bad here, we know that modifying this is gonna modify this hash, which in turn is modify this hash, this hash, and the root hash. So the whole branch gets modified by even that small change. 
So when John and Peter again wants to verify there's a, there was a mistake, they can go directly to the root hash and say, okay, it is different, so we have an issue. They start here, right? Is this hash the same? Yes, it is. So they know right away that the issue it's in the lower half of the list. So they move here directly and say, and say okay, is this uh, different? Uh, no, it's the same. So now they know that the issue is between these two last values. So they go here. Is this the issue? No, it's the same. This is the one that is different. So because this is supposed to be rat. So once again, uh, let's see how many how many steps it, it took for them to find which one was failing. So they verified this one, two, and three. So only three steps, right? So you can see as as the Merkle tree uh, started to grow, the number of steps to find this single error decreased. Uh, and we can actually compare even with the very initial example when there was only lists, right? At the very beginning, they didn't have any Merkle tree. They just had two lists. So in this case, the, the error was found after checking eight, right? So compare, we went from eight to five to three by growing this Merkle tree and getting to the point that is like, this is a binary, uh, a binary tree. Uh, so one interesting uh, conclusion about this as well is notice that there is a trade-off with using Merkle trees. So you gain a lot in performance when searching for one item and you can very quickly verify if there's a mistake just by checking the root trees. That is another big win. But notice that the amount of data that you have to store is increasing. Uh, initially, in this example, uh, it only required for each one of them only eight cells for storage. Let me create here some extra space. So one above. When we move to the first layer of the Merkle tree, uh, it took now double, right? Because we have the data and now the hash. So eight, nine, 10, 11. And when we get to the final form of the Merkle tree using a binary tree, it's even worse. So we have, uh, oh, sorry. This is uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, not 11, it's 19. And now we have uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 23. So you can see how this, uh, this trade-off is, is being performed between speed or performance for search and storage. But one thing to keep in mind that for, for a computer, processing time and time in general is a very scarce resource and it's very expensive. Compared to a storage, we tend to be really cheap. So this is a trade-off trade -off that is, is worth um, making. Uh, now let me go one st a step uh, further and show you how, how this balance changes when we have less or more values in our list. So I have this other example here right so you can see that i have this example using uh, only four items right so i'm just comparing here the interesting case is when there's a single error in the list you can see that in the in the binary form we, we group two values at a time it takes two search uh, to find the error but 11 cells in storage when we have a list of eight, which is the one that we had before an example, it takes three steps, but we have to store 23 cells. When we have a list of 16, it takes <coughs> four steps, but now it takes 47 cells for storage. If we go to 32, <coughs> now we have, uh, it's only five steps, but now we have to store 95 cells of information. So if we compare those values, you can see how they progress. So this blue line is just the number of items in the list. Let me bring this chart a little closer. So you see that we have a list of four, eight, 16, and 32 animals. This is the blue line. And then we have how many, 
how many cells we had to search to find the error. It was two, three, four, five, you can see, and that is the red line. And then we have how many cells for storage it was required, and that is the yellow line. So if you noticed, the, the, the number of uh, searches required, it follows a logarithmic progression. So two, three, four, five is just the log, uh, log x of these values, log four, log, log base two of four, log base two of eight, log base two of 16, log base two of 32. And that base two is because we're comparing uh, the binary tree where we group two items at a time. Uh, so this is what we're calling in like a logarithmic complexity and O block N. And then when we compare the storage or the number of cells required, it follows this formula, 3x minus one, which in um, also when we talk about logarithmic complexity or, or time of execution, is just O, big O, N. Uh, so you can see that as the data set becomes larger, the benefit of searches of the time for search keeps getting even better. Uh, and the storage grows uh, at a linear progression, the same as the data set. So there you go. Uh, that is what a Merkle tree is used for. And uh, this very intuitive in, in example, it's heavily used in Bitcoin because we have to store all the transactions in the system, right? When you send money to one person to another, that transaction needs to be stored and we need to find a mechanism to, to make sure that every node in the network, they have the same value, that they're storing the same transactions in blocks. And Merkle trees are used for that exact purpose.